Hello and welcome to Rock Paper Shotgun, or should that be Cluck Paper Shotgun? Today's video is set to a soundtrack of wailing chicken deaths, as I turn Sekiro's elite ninja warrior loose on 16th century Japan's chicken population. Can I call it self-defence? There is definitely something very wrong with these beat boys. I imagine months from now someone much smarter than I will produce a 30 minute video essay explaining the deep lore behind these huge mother cluckers. How cursed chicken feed led to a growth spurt perhaps, or how Colonel Sanders had relatives in Sengoku era Japan. But no, to be honest, I'm starting with them as this is pretty much my only video footage where I don't get ritually humiliated every 5 seconds. They say put your best foot forward, and my best foot is killing poultry. Performing instant kill takedowns, or death blows as they're called here, serves up an easy victory in a world that offers very few of them, and helps me deal with issues that I've not shaken since fighting Bloodborne's horrifying flightless crows. Plus, I just can't get enough of the sword plunging animation of the one armed wolf's coup de gras, or should that be coup de gras? There is a serious point amongst the foul chicken puns oop, foul, there's another one that the game hands you a couple of easy wins is indicative of Sekiro's slightly modified take on the From Software formula. This is clearly the spiritual successor to Dark Souls and Bloodborne in so many ways. High risk combat, panicked glugging of health potions, enemies who hide like naughty schoolboys waiting to jump out and say boo. I see you there, Mr. Hammerman or the delightful way that shortcuts reveal levels as vast looping mazes. But Sekiro isn't as straightforward as Dark Souls but with katanas. It is in many ways From Software's most accessible game yet. In the opening hours I've played, it's definitely their most welcoming. But are its smoother edges lulling us into a false sense of security before the true horrors begin? Game director Hidetaka Miyazaki himself believes this to be friendlier to beginners. Talking to The Telegraph earlier in the month, he said that one of the benefits of working with Activision is that they placed a big role in areas we don't particularly consider our forte, such as onboarding, tutorials and general user comfort. I'll admit, when Activision revealed they were publishing Sekiro, I was puzzled. From software make uncompromising action visions, where Activision want to be loved by the masses. They are the co Coca-Cola to From Software's Dandelion and Burdock. For our non-British viewers, that's like root beer, but a bit more wrong. But applying some populist polish to a Miyazaki game has definitely paid off. Sekiro explains itself better than previous From games. A tutorial area that I can't show here talks you through a full moveset without asking you to learn basic buttons from notes scrawled on the floor. Emerge into the story proper and you find a training area where you can safely practice parries and step dodges against the immortal Hanbei. Just in case that sounds too conventional, this sparring sesh does end with blades plunged into poor Hanbei's neck. Don't worry, as the name suggests, he's not going anywhere. But still, it's more of an open-armed invitation to new warriors, even if it is delivered with a sinister glint in its eye. The storytelling is clearer too. NPCs in the opening area explain, in no uncertain terms, who you are and what your mission is, with dialogue trees if you need it repeating. Having bounced off Dark Souls and Bloodborne many times before finding a foothold in their beguiling worlds, I appreciate the momentum and obvious motivations this brings to Sekiro's earlier hours. And this doesn't mean it isn't open to that interpretation and analysis that is the bedrock of Miyazaki's sprawling fantasy visions. The sculptor who crafts a prosthetic limb for our one-armed hero is still a cryptic, unknowable creation. From the way you can't angle the camera on his face, to the more worrying audience of warped Buddha statues that he's endlessly whittling. There are questions to be asked and mysteries to be unpicked, but the basics, the who, the what and the why, are spelled out in a way that you might not expect from Miyazaki. This clarity also runs through guard gossip that you overhear in the world. The eavesdrop skill ties into the shadow craft of being a ninja, and allows writers to foreshadow boss encounters, or offer sly hints of how to deal with those future challenges. 
I particularly like how guards get a visible tick when they are out of gossip, as if Miyazaki is finally giving you permission to pounce on them. It's your bants or your life. That is the way of Sekiro. Eavesdropping, of course, is a relatively harmless ninja tool, especially compared to head dropping, which is the ancient art of dropping a sword into someone's head, a tactic that proves effective throughout our time in Sekiro. It made me realise that a ninja is a very different character than we expect from From Software. It's a power fantasy, a hero defined by efficiency and deadliness, coming from a studio that usually challenges you to work with the awkwardness of lumbering knights or burly monster hunters. To deliver on the excitement of being a shinobi, there are moments where you're allowed to feel immense power. A grappling hook gives you speed and freedom of movement that lets you pick angles of attack and escape danger to live to fight another day, and then to fight it in a different way. Guards often lurk below convenient high perches, letting you perform plunging death blows before vanishing away again. Where two guards stand together, the shock of your rude entrance is often enough to give you time to hack away at their surprise chum. The grappling hook also gives the means to avoid tougher enemies. Why fight the bruising General Kawarada when you can leap over his nearby gate? Incidentally, I'm not sure how he rose to the position of General with such poor gate-watching abilities. A later encounter with a shinobi hunter is easily sidestepped by plunging into a nearby river and grappling up a cliff face. There is a price for cowardice. These named enemies have the prayer beads and gourd seeds that you need to upgrade healing items and increase your vitality, but the option is there. I found myself making much faster progress than I usually do in Miyazaki's games, still dying a lot, which I'll get to in a moment, but having a moveset that makes repeat runs a lot swifter. Yes, you could run past enemies you are sick of fighting in From's older games, but once you've learned a Sekiro level layout, the combination of grappling hook and death blows lets you find optimal deadly routes. I don't mind retreading paths like this when it's done with such velocity and venom. A lot of this feeling of power ties into stealth. From Software own the rights to and published several Tenchu games, the excellent ninja simulator where sneaking was vital. Sekiro lets you hide in the grass, zip to unguarded rooftops, or hang from walls while angry enemies unleash rifle fire at you. But it isn't a stealth game in the same sense. The enemy AI doesn't feel sophisticated enough for you to properly toy with. They can be suspicious or alarmed, and once they are alert, they seem quite stupid, just firing directly into walls where they couldn't possibly see or get you. And the option to draw them away from patrol patterns by throwing ceramic shards is really no more sophisticated than chucking pebbles in Bloodborne. Occasionally you luck out and a guard will wander into a shadier corner for a quick shanking, but you don't appear to have much control over that. What I'm saying is Tenchu fans shouldn't expect to sneak through the whole game, stealth does have its limits. The more I played Sekiro however, the more I saw stealth as the entree to full combat a poisoned volivant, if you will. Taking a quiet approach lets you remove smaller enemies, gradually picking off the extra pairs of hands that would wade in when you decide to engage a tougher foe in one-on-one -on -one combat. I've often thought there was a puzzle element to Miyazaki's games, about picking off enemies in the optimal order to prevent the horde from descending on them. As I moved between foot soldiers and snipers in the outskirts of Ashino Castle, I got a clear sense of how a ninja is just a much better vessel for this type of action. Also, when it comes to more significant enemies, like the named sub-bosses, stealth may give you an advantage, but it can't kill outright. These enemies tend to have multiple layers to their health and require two death blows to finish, indicated by the red dots above their vitality bar. Dropping on the general's head or leaping out the bushes to backstab the shinobi hunter will instantly eat through half their health, a great start, but you are then in open combat. And no, you can't just run off, wait for them to chill out, and then try hitting them with a second death blow. Leave them long enough and their health regenerates. And no, I'm not embarrassed to say that I did try cheesing it. 
If the ability to start combat on your terms makes this Miyazaki's most powerful hero to date, I'd argue it's counterbalanced by his fiercest swordplay system yet. Sekiro's combat revolves around breaking enemy's posture, indicated by the orange bar at the top of the screen. Your own bar is the one at the bottom. Posture builds with every hit or block, and when it fills to the top, you can perform an instant kill. It's a system that rewards constant pressure, and on the flip side, requires you to be in constant danger. It's actually much easier to escape trouble in Sekiro. You don't have a stamina bar limiting your evasive moves, but what good is distance when you're meant to be up close driving that posture meter up? In this light, it's more of an evolution of Bloodborne than Dark Souls. Where that game encouraged aggression to earn back health, this demands a forward push to stand any chance of breaking the enemy. There are further twists, of course. Just about any attack can be parried by blocking at the last minute. And this really is the most desirable move, as it prevents you from taking the posture hit from blocking and drives their posture right up. A single parry can break some smaller enemies in one go, letting you slice through smaller patrols in a blood-spurting rampage. To prevent combat from becoming a parrying pushover, enemies have unblockable perilous attacks, signified by this red danger sign. This will either be a thrust, a sweep or a grab. Each can be negated with a rock-paper-scissors style reaction. You can jump a sweep, deflect a thrust or step dodge a grab. But reading the animations was beyond my abilities in the limited time I had with the game. Swordplay has a fascinating rhythm to it. When performed as intended, it's one of the fastest combat systems I can recall. You'll shrug off danger, chew through defences, and end lives in a fountain of blood as if it was nothing. But when the same power is turned back on you, it is ferociously overwhelming. The lower your health, the faster the posture bar rises, meaning that desperation is met with even greater incoming danger. For every fight in the first few hours where I sliced through like a hot knife through butter, there were ten whomping defeats where Miyazaki went for the butter sauce and just dropped a cow on me. Victories and defeats in Sekiro feel decisive by design, which is empowering or enfeebling based on which you've most recently experienced. Even death seems to balance the kind and the cruel. Sekiro has an unusual relationship with dying, a fact heavily hinted at by the title, Shadows Die Twice. Based on Miyazaki's track record, you'd expect it to be called Shadows Die Lots, or man, I can't believe my shadow is already dead again. But this time, death is not the end. Ignore those ominous words appearing on screen, you can resurrect and get back into the action. In reality, this often didn't turn my fate around. Sekiro is a game that rewards patience and discipline, and springing from the grave hardly inspires either. I was often jittery from the adrenaline of combat that had just downed me, and so my second life would end even faster than the first. You know when you keep dying in a boss fight, and the anger makes you sloppier and sloppier? Well, this is that, but at a much faster rate. You're better off taking a breath and using resurrection as a tactical opportunity. When you fall in combat, attackers lose interest and foolishly turn their backs to a corpse that still has its sword in his hand. It ends as you might expect. In this moment, the mechanic brings to mind the fake death pill in Metal Gear Solid 3. Gobble one of those bad boys down and guards would leave your fake corpse alone. Of course, the pill would kill you if you didn't revive fast enough, and so it is here. Sekiro's death becomes permanent if you wait too long, so there's a horrible tension of waiting for soldiers to walk away before pressing the button. Another glorious balance of risk and reward. Of course, don't think that a second chance means from software are going soft. A true death may be delayed, but it comes with an even fiercer consequence. When you die, your experience and currency are halved, but they aren't waiting for you where you died, as with Dark Souls Souls or Bloodborne's Echoes. These are gone for good. I'm still trying to work out what's worse, losing everything but having a chance at reclaiming it, or losing half of everything for good. It feels like one of those philosophical thought experiments that I have no chance of understanding unless The Good Place explains it to me using fart jokes. But all is not lost. Upon death you have a chance of receiving unseen aid, a blessing from the gods that lets you keep all your treasures. 
At the opening of the game, the probability of unseen aid sits at 30%, pretty slim but a welcome surprise when it does kick in, but even this is fragile. <coughs> For story reasons that I won't spoil, every time you resurrect you cause the spread of a disease called Dragon Rot. Now to me this sounds like something a builder might make up to squeeze extra money from you. Yeah pal, afraid you got the old Dragon Rot, house is riddled with the stuff. But how I wish it was only something that got into the floorboards. This rot gets into the bones of the NPCs themselves. Every time the disease spreads, you're given the names of people it has freshly infected, the sculptor or the scared maid. On an emotional level, it's terrible to think that your butterfingers are spreading a lung rotting illness into total strangers. But the punishment is more tangible than that. The more people suffering the rot, the lower your unseed aid probability is. By the end of my demo, it's about 10%. As I mentioned with the combat above, when you fail in Sekiro, you fail fast and you fail hard. The disease is reversible. At one point, a man living inside a pot offers to sell us a curative dragon's blood droplet in exchange for the scale of a giant cart. But in a limited three hour demo, I don't really dedicate any time to fishing. I mean, look at the size of these things. There is no way I'm jumping in that pond. I am intrigued to see how readily these droplets are available, whether there's a finite amount of healing that can be done before the rot sets in for good. Yeah, yeah. All of this adds up so that when I look at the state of the wolf at the end of my three hours, I feel like a hero besieged. I've cowardly avoided the fights that might boost my health, I've died enough that I stand no chance of recuperating my lost items, and I'm trapped in an endless battle with a sake spitting ogre man who is simply beyond my parrying abilities. I feel what I feel in the early hours of so many Miyazaki games, the creeping sensation of dread that I've hit my natural limit. But I can't claim Sekiro hasn't given me many chances, it has explained its rules, handed me an agile hero, and let me even the odds from the shadows. It is kind by From Software standards but cruel in equal measure. For better and for worse, it's the only game I've thought about since playing it, and I am desperate for the 22nd to get here so I can have my ass kicked afresh. I hope you've enjoyed this meandering look at Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. These games are notoriously tricky to preview, given that they require patience and focus to master and overcome. Hopefully I've explained everything clearly, but if not, pop any questions in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. If you did enjoy watching this video, I'd love for you to subscribe to Rock Paper Shotgun. We cover anything that appears on PC, and we'll have lots more Sekiro fun to come when the game arrives. Why not check out recent previews of Innocence of Plague Tale, or our review of Devil May Cry 5 for a better flavour of what the channel offers. Thanks for watching, and I'll hopefully see you soon. Bye for now.